praise God for a time to worship Him once more. Brothers and sisters, as we come together, let us remember the words of Psalm 19, verse 14, and may this be the prayer of our hearts. It says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Let us now rise for our opening song. Brothers and sisters, let us now proceed to a time of confession. Just tell God the things that is in your heart, the things that you have done that you shouldn't have done, and the things that you have left undone. Let us now pray. Now let us be comforted by the absolution. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us now rise as we declare this psalm responsively. Our psalm for this morning is taken from Psalm 114. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, the sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turn back. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Let us say together, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now be seated to hear the word of God. The lesson is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, 
he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. The Word of the Lord Brothers and sisters, we who belong to God's family are not simply called to idly enjoy our relationship with God, but also to give others the opportunity to experience it for themselves. And so may our anthem for this morning and also our message remind us of this truth and allow us to rise strong together for Christ. O chosen
Brothers and sisters in Christ, a happy Sunday to you all. Time really flies by so quickly. It seems like just yesterday we, when we were wrapping up our I Believe series, and now here we are again to wrap up our I Belong series with the last installment on the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I hope that this month has been a fruitful one in helping each of us grasp the kind of church we belong to. United, bonded together, special, set apart, universal, connected. These are some of the key words that have been used so far, and we will add yet another two in defining the apostolic church. Now, I must confess that it took me a long time to find a description that captures the meaning of the church's apostolicity, mainly because one, the word apostolic may not mean anything to some people, and two, the word may mean different things to others. For example, I asked a few people what they wanted to know about the apostolic church, and some of them have no idea at all what it is. Then if you search the internet, it may raise more questions than answers. Is it referring to the apostolic church movement? that rose out of the charismatic Pentecostal church? Or is it talking about apostolic succession, the idea that our present bishops are direct successors of the original apostles, often more specifically, the apostle Peter? There are so many things to unpack with just the word apostolic, which unfortunately, we don't have the space and time to do so right now. However, what we can do is put all of those aside from our minds for the meantime because that's not how the word apostolic was meant in the creeds. Instead, we will draw the definition of apostolic based on the catechism of our own Book of Common Prayer and, of course, from the Word of God. Shall we begin? In our catechism, we ask, why is the church described as apostolic? And the answer is, the church is apostolic because it continues in the teaching and fellowship of the apostles and is sent to carry out Christ's mission to all people. Now, from this definition, let me highlight the first description which captures the essence of our apostolicity. And that is, we belong to a church that continues on. Or we can say, a church that presses on. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 21 tells us that having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. To be apostolic, simply put, is this. The church we belong to now is the continuation of the church that Jesus built. Even after thousands of years since Jesus ascended into heaven, the church he founded still continues on, carrying the same mission, upholding the same core beliefs, and exists for the same purpose. Literally, this means that we belong to a church that is already more than 2,000 years. Now let's try to appreciate that even more. Do you know that according to studies, back in the 1950s, the average lifespan of a standard and poor company, basically the top 500 companies like Fortune 500, the average lifespan of such a company was only about 60 years. But in 2019, the average lifespan went down to about only 12 to 15 years before that company is either bought acquired or liquidated. Now, most companies, no matter how good and profitable, are not built to last. Even the best ones we have right now, the top five, for example, Apple is only 45 years old, Microsoft, 46, Amazon, 27, Facebook, 17, and Google, 22. If we place this side by side with the church then, we see just how extraordinary and even miraculous it is that the church has been continuing on 
for more than 2,000 years, withstanding the test of time, societal and cultural changes, and some internal challenges. To be specific, the church has survived the great persecution of the early church, the great schism, the dark ages, two world wars. And though no one can say that the church has been perfect, and nor is it in perfect shape right now, but in the essentials, the church is still the church that Jesus built. And we still believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. We still uphold his word as our standard for faith and practice. We still faithfully await his second coming. The apostolic church is a church that continues on and presses on. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were to be honest, there are times when I worry whether the church can still survive in the years to come, especially considering this pandemic and how drastically it has changed not just the church, but close to everything. There are times when I wonder whether we can make it out of this pandemic intact. When this is done, how many in the church will have left and how few will have stayed? Will a time come when our members have already gotten so used to not being able to go to church that they wouldn't really want to when the time comes that they are allowed to once again? And other than the pandemic, will we be able to stay relevant to the needs of the new generation? And will we be able to communicate the gospel in a way that resonates with their longings and their desires? How much will the world powers and structures change in a few years from now? And what if the moral climate becomes overly hostile towards the biblical godliness that we teach? And soon, will we be able to press on then? And really, as I ponder on these things, on top of my mind and in the bottom of my heart, I think about my children and the future families in our church. Will my children and the next generation of our church get to be part of a community of believers who will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Will they be reading and studying the Bible, learning to love the Word of God? Will they be taught to surrender their lives to Jesus as their Lord and Master? Will they have teachers and counselors who will guide and lead them to follow and obey God's commands? How about you? Does the prospect of your children and your children's children not being followers of Jesus bother you as well? Is the thought that our next generation not having a church to belong to something that deeply concerns you as well? If it does, as it should, then let's share in both the encouragement and the challenge of being an an apostolic church. First, be encouraged because our apostolicity ensures us that the church will surely press on. It has done so for the past 2,000 years and will continue to do so for generations to come. What is the source of this confidence? Remember, The passage that we read earlier, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 21, tells us that we are built on the Lord Jesus Christ. This means that the future of our church is not dependent on the forces in the world, but on the power of God. It is not dependent on the desires of men, but on the plans of God. The church will surely press on because Jesus promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, the church is built to last. But now second, there's a challenge for us. So if we say that we have a guarantee that the church is going to last, does it mean that we can relax and just passively let Jesus fulfill his sovereign plans? This is how some people think, right? If God's will is going to happen anyways, then what does it have to do with me? It doesn't matter what I do or what I don't do. But let me ask you this. If you discovered that your son has a special gift, 
uh, for playing the piano, for example, will you just relax and let him passively become a great pianist if such a thing exists? Will you not make sure he gets training and practice diligently so that he can reach his full potential? The same goes for our church. We are guaranteed that we will continue on, but that doesn't take away our responsibility to press on and make sure that we have done our part. If we go back to the Catechism in the Book of Common Prayer, there is another word that talks about our part, and that is the word sent. And this is really such a well-suited word because apostle in Greek literally means one who is sent off. So to be apostolic necessarily means that we have an active role in ensuring that the church fulfills her mission because we are sent. And then in a reading, the Apostle Paul also emphasizes this same challenge to do our part. Paul knew his life will not be for long anymore. In fact, 2 Timothy is considered the last of his letters. And on top of his mind and at the bottom of his heart, there is a concern for the future of the church. He needed to ensure that the gospel of Jesus will continue to be preached. And that's why he leaves this instruction with Timothy in verse 2. He says, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. We may call this the apostolic strategy, the means by which the church has survived up to this point was because the apostles taught faithful men to pass it on to people who will also faithfully pass it on. We can say that the church that presses on is a church that passes it on. Again, the church that presses on is a church that passes it on. I came across this while doing research on the oldest company still operating today. And one noteworthy entry is about a, a 1,300 year old hot spring in Japan called Nishiyama Onsen Keyunkan, the oldest running hotel in the world. It says that this hotel has been run by the same family for 52 generations. And that the secret to its success is a sense of intergenerational pride. Not just the owners, but also some of the staff who held the same post for generations, passing it from parent to child to grandchildren. Their commitment to hospitality and service stems from a shared desire to protect the inn. One of the things that fascinated me here was how across 52 generations, can you imagine that, nobody thought of abandoning the hotel for reasons such as, I want to work in the city, or I want to carve out my own destiny, I want to start my own business, I don't want to take care of this old building anymore. Instead, there was a sense of pride in being a part of such a legacy that it was left to them to ensure that the business continues on. And this is what we should hear from our passage as well. No doubt there are countless reasons why we may think of giving up on the church at times. And I'm sure that each one of us will come across things we would rather pursue at one point in time. But I hope that we can see how great an honor and a privilege it is that we have been entrusted with the task of preserving the legacy, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and faithfully pass it on from generation to generation. I hope that by now, all of us have a better grasp of the apostolicity of our church, a church that continues on, and is sent, a church that presses on and passes it on. And if you truly comprehend these things, the natural question for us to ask right now is, so what? What do we do with this information? Well, if 
you come across a company that has a strong corporate mission, the salvation of people and bringing hope to the world, and the company has a unique core strength that it is built on Jesus Christ. And it has a long-term management plan, the apostolic strategy. The only logical next step is to invest in it, right? Now again, let's employ a business metaphor. Do you know the difference between a company's shareholders and stakeholders? Simply put, shareholders are primarily concerned on whether or not they can earn a profit, whereas stakeholders have a vested interest in the success of an organization. For example, if you are into stocks, you can become a shareholder of big companies, right? But your primary concern is to put your money while the stock price is low and pull it out before it goes down and earn the highest profit possible. You can even say that you may look forward to the failure of a company because you can buy stocks cheap, right? But stakeholders are a company's customers, employees, suppliers, and vendors, etc. Their connection to a company and its product and services are stronger and more intertwined. So their primary concern at all times is for its success. Now, when it comes to the church, there are also members who act as stakeholders and members who act as shareholders. Now, how so? A stakeholder would be someone who is, uh, we can say, is deeply invested in the church, giving a lot of time and effort to it, concerned about how the church is doing, if its needs are being met, if its future is secure. You often think about the church, pray for the church, and keep up to date about what is going on in the church. A shareholder, however, would be someone who is maybe minimally invested. Attending church or watching online services from time to time, maybe doing some ministry tasks here and there, uh, but doesn't see themselves as an active part of the church in the long run. A shareholder, when he or she starts to see problems arise in the church, or when asked to invest a little more concern and effort, will be quick to jump ship and move on. Which one are you? Are you a stakeholder or a shareholder? Are you in the church for what you can profit and get, or are you committed to its success because something of value to you is at stake? In verses 3 to 7, the Apostle Paul gave three illustrations and a command to reflect on them. Let's lay it down this way, in terms of their investment and reward. The first illustration, the soldier invests his focus and dedication. He does not get entangled with civilian affairs, meaning he is not distracted, he is not tied down. Duty comes first before extracurriculars. His reward is to please his commanding officer. The second illustration, the athlete invests his integrity. He plays by the rules, and his reward is to receive the victor's crown. And finally, the farmer invests his hard work, his time and labor, and his reward is a share of the crops. Now, what can we make of all this? This teaches us that when we put an investment, we will receive a reward. There is an interest to be earned. The soldier, the athlete, and farmer each get what they seek because they invested what was necessary to achieve it. And similarly, in verses 8 to 10, Paul shares about his own example. He invested his all. Enduring suffering, even imprisonment, even the idea of death, right? But it was all worth it because his interest and reward was the gospel of Christ, the salvation of souls. What about us? This is something that is meant for you and I to reflect on and decide. Are you willing, are we willing to be a good soldier dedicated to please God, 
an athlete who will not succumb to shortcuts and to be a hard-working farmer giving the time and energy that is required if the reward is to please god to be a faithful servant to and to reap many souls for jesus are these interests worth the investment you are being asked to make but remember the trustworthy saying in verses 11 to 13 if we died with him we will also live with him if we endure we will also reign with him but if we disown him he will also disown us if we are faithless he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself to close our message let us hear paul's exhortation in verse 1 you then my son be strong in the grace that is in christ jesus brothers and sisters in christ we your church family know that the times are especially challenging and especially hard but we have a reason and a means to rise strong. And that is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incomparable worth of knowing Him, the deep gratitude from being saved by Him. This is the touch point of our identity as the Apostolic Church, that we are witnesses of who Jesus is. And if we have experienced being loved by Him, by being enlightened by His Word, if we have learned to trust and obey Him because of His love and His care for us, this becomes our source of strength to keep investing in the mission of the Church. This becomes our motivation to press on and pass it on. May God's Word work in all of our hearts and teach us to truly become and truly belong as invested stakeholders in the one holy catholic and apostolic church We praise God that he has placed us in this wonderful family, which is the church. Right now, let us all declare our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Let us all rise. Let us proudly declare, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us now pray. Please kneel if able or please be seated. Let us begin with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us continue to spend time in prayer with our God. O God, we are your church. May we never forget our calling to be one, to be holy, 
to acknowledge our Catholicity and to continue on with our apostolic heritage. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. There is nothing more blessed than to know we are yours. May we never fail to see this great privilege that we have. Day by day, we bless you. Lord, keep us from all sin today. We commit to you our special meeting today as we decide on our church's future and commit to you our plans for the coming months and the year ahead. May we ever see your guiding hand before us. Lord, show us your love and mercy. In the midst of this seemingly unending pandemic and seeing our powerlessness against sin and the powers of this world, we cry, in you, Lord, is our hope. Let us now take a moment to pray for our own needs and those of others. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now pray together our collect of the day to remind us of what we are to do as a church. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us now close using the prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And now receive this blessing. To him who by means of his power working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of, to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time, forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. Please be seated for a few announcements. Brothers and sisters, for our first announcement, we would like to remind everyone about the special meeting today. That's July 25, at 2 p.m. We will be voting on our constitution amendments that will affect our vestry election. So this will be via Zoom, and if you still don't have the link, please get in touch with our church office.
Again, we would like to remind each one who is joining to have their own device and to make sure that you have a good internet connection. For our second announcement, brothers and sisters, with the threat of the COVID Delta variant rising in NCR, it is with great reluctance that we will be indefinitely postponing our resumption for next week. We ask for everyone to do all that you can to protect yourself and our community by taking advantage of the vaccines and being strict with the health protocols set by our government. We hope that we can prevent another spike as well and that this pandemic will end at the soonest possible time. Meanwhile, aside from viewing our services online, we would like to encourage you to join the corporate services, virtual services that are being hosted by our fellowships so we may at least get a sense of corporate worship, which is not only essential for us, but is also desired by God for us in Scripture. Let us continue to pray that we may be delivered from this pandemic soon and that no more variants would arise. And so as we go out into the world after our time of worship, may we go by the strength of the Spirit to love and serve the Lord. Right now, let us rise and sing our closing song.
Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus.